Tyler Neely can help you to test if your code is really the best. He will show you techniques to test with some tweaks to lay our biases to rest. Who likes bugs? Ooh. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. So this talk is about reliable infrastructure. Uh, and what I mean by that is basically things that we can rely on, um, like that are foundational, like databases, servers, uh, services, libraries, um, things that kind of get reused in different places. Um, and also trying to attack biases that we put into these things. Um, so another name for this talk could be the clear expression of beliefs through code. So who am I? Um, I've kind of started as like an SRE, um, facing a lot of bugs in production at uh, social media companies, and then I worked for like cloud infrastructure companies, and then like serverless companies. Um, so I've seen like a bunch of like weird infrastructure things. Um, and then I got super burned out, um, and I moved to Berlin and just got lazy and just started working on personal projects, kind of culminating in a project called SLED, uh, which is like a database construction kit and some testing things. So if you want to like build a database in Rust, uh, it's like a collection of modular components, like a page cache that you can just take and, uh, and basically build fairly high performance things with very little effort. Um, I built like a, a BW tree and like a thousand lines of Rust on top of this. So you can, you can build really complex things without very much effort on top of a page cache. Uh, anyway, um, today I work on open source coin, uh, which aims to better fund and empower free software. And you might know me as a Space Jam. So, uh, some people might forget. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so what I'm going to be talking about today, um, ourselves, the things we create, and the context that we exist in. Um, and also mechanically uh, confronting our assumptions and basically trying to test things that are networked and use sockets. Um, and then some just like random miscellaneous tips on architecture, uh, maybe some lineage driven fault injection if we get to it. Um, and basically ways of like really wringing out the bugs from our systems. Uh, things that I'm not going to cover, so reliable infrastructure, to many people means things like uh, metrics and introspection, time series databases, capacity planning, and these things are crucial for actually running reliable software, but I think that they're covered very well. Um, in particular, I'd like to direct your attention to these three books, uh, one by Brendan Gregg. Um, you might know him because that's like the flame graph guy. Um, he wrote this wonderful book, uh, Systems Performance Enterprise Cloud. Uh, particularly chapter two on um, methodology is really worth checking out. Um, the Google SRE book is great for particularly like uh, building things in a way that uh, is introspectable and also um, some of like the social aspects of running teams that have to deal with reliable infrastructure. This book's great for it. Um, and of course, Martin Putman's designing data intensive application is like really good for kind of like uh, understanding the theory behind databases and distributed systems and uh, correctness and things like that. Um, so check out those books. They're, they're really good for those kind of things. Um, but we are going to be talking more about uh, efficient ways of getting bugs out of our systems because I think that this is a topic that has not been covered very well. Um, so this is your brain. Um, Everything we know is kind of wrong because our perception is so fuzzy. Um, and then, uh, like, so everything that gets into our brains is like kind of wrong based on our local like experiences. Um, and then when we try to make things, it's kind of like running those assumptions in reverse. And uh, basically, the things we create kind of reflect these biases symmetrically. Um, and uh, also, we tend not to ask our beliefs to pay rent. And what I mean by this is basically asking, you know, what do these beliefs kind of predict should happen? And also, what do these beliefs kind of make us think should be less likely? If beliefs don't constrain any possible realities, then they, they don't really help us guide decisions. They could be useful in other ways, but um, uh, to the extent that we're trying to make reliable code, this is important. Um, and we don't do cache invalidation when we realize that things are wrong that we believe. Um, and also, we kind of stack beliefs on top of each other in ways that can like make these like teetering towers of beliefs that like you rip out a Jenga cube and like you would you would hope it would like uh, you know tumble to the ground, but instead it just stays floating there in the air and we continue to base decisions on it. Um, not so useful. Um, anyway, I'd love to keep talking about this like brain stuff, um, but let's uh, kind of bridge this into code. Um, if you want to learn more about that, I recommend checking out Rationality from AI to Zombies. Um, but really, I think that reliable infrastructure. Uh, kind of boils down to confronting assumptions. So these things are kind of nice to talk about and address. Um, OK, so given the fact that our code kind of represents the culmination of our biases, 
um, and like the, the things that we, we think with some error in them. Um, when we write tests, they're also symmetrically affected by these biases. And this can be problematic because when we write tests, uh, they often uh, basically don't look for things that we've already thought about. Um, and this is pretty problematic um, because, I mean, how often have you found a bug in a system in production or just like running your code and you just realize like, oh, I, I, you know, I thought I had like great t test coverage. Um, I should have caught this, but like my test just didn't cover it. And it turns out that like if you're just writing like unit tests, um, even if you have like 100% uh, line and branch coverage, that's only one dimension of the entire space of your program. There's also like all the different values of all the variables throughout it um, that are just totally unaddressed. Um, just relying on on like a bunch of unit tests uh, makes your code very subject to um, what's called the pesticide paradox, where your code becomes immune to your tests. Um, but that doesn't actually make, mean that it's like all that useful for other things. Um, so uh, how can we, like what should we do if, if like our tests that we write uh, tend not to be like as effective as they could be? Um, don't write them, uh, just don't write tests. Uh, come on, like testing is boring. Um, I know I don't really enjoy writing tests manually, um, but uh, we, can, we can do a lot better uh, by writing what we expect and then mechanically generating the tests, and we can basically have the machine create more tests than we would have like many lifetimes to write by hand. Um, and if we can do this, then we can get a lot of mileage out of things. Um, we should make our beliefs explicit, and the beliefs that are present in our code should pay rent. And I would like to introduce you to property testing, uh, which is a wonderful way of doing this. So there's kind of a new, t uh, a new crate in the Rust ecosystem called prop test, where um, you basically write these macros, and um, you know, this looks a lot like a normal test, uh, except uh, you can pr uh, specify these generators um, and basically provide variables into your test, um, and the generators will provide specific instances of these, these different inputs. Um, so if you have not been subjected to the cruel realities of uh, modern computing machinery, you might assume that this uh, could be correct, like multiplying something by five and then dividing it by five. You might expect that to you know, equal the, what you put in in the first place. Um, people who have not been so lucky or like, subjected to the cruel whims of the machine um, might guess what's going to happen. We run cargo test. Uh, the prop test library is able to identify a specific very large number uh, that um, when multiplied by five will like, basically flag the overflow flag um, or the overflow register on our CPUs and Rust checks for this when not running in release mode um, and it will cause a panic. Um, yeah, prop test pays a lot of attention to the edge cases. But also really, like this is a really cool thing because it also basically just wrote a regression test for us. Um, so prop test just created this file and prop test regressions, and it basically shows the random number generator seed that it used to generate the specific failing input um, for our test. And anytime it runs a new test, it will basically go through all of the things in this regressions file and uh, like basically make sure that it, it tries those first. And uh, if, if we haven't passed that yet, um, it will just keep deterministically replaying it. So prop test is nice because it gives us some, some non-determinism in checking random values, but also we get deterministic replay of our bugs that it does find. So it's a really wonderful way of just you know, coming up with tests for us. We just say what we expect and then it does the rest. You can also do this for things that involve compression or like uh, serialization, basically things that um, you expect to like, do a round trip of some sort and retain their original identity. Um, and uh, it's, it's like quite commonly used in like, if you're writing like a JSON deserializer or something, um, then like it, this is a, a, a pretty straightforward thing to use. Um, and you can basically provide more interesting patterns as well. Um, you can basically give it like regexes and it will generate text that, that satisfies them. It's, uh, it's really cool. Um, you can also provide your own generators. Um, for instance, in, uh, in Bodle's crate, uh, uh, with the immutable data structures, there's a whole like, uh, like collection of interesting prop test macros. Um, so if, if you're curious about um, looking at more examples of prop test, uh, check out MRS. There's tons of examples there. Um, also, if you have a system with configuration uh, that the user can change, you better expect your users to configure your system um, in ways that like, uh, maybe you don't expect. Um, so my friend Yash is basically doing a Rust port of the DAT protocol, and uh, this is a, a library called sparse bit field that's a part of it. 
And uh, one day we were just hanging out at a cafe and, uh, and said, oh, did you hear about the prop test library? And uh, I was like, yeah, let's try it out. So this was actually the, the first thing that we wrote together um, to kind of play with prop test. And it just like immediately caused the code to blow up. Um, and it's like really not so much testing, but like, you know, you, you might expect uh, users to configure things in ways that we didn't expect. Specifically what this is doing is it's configuring this library with a particular uh, page size, and then it's like actually using one of the, the methods on the library. Um, so it's like, Without very much effort put into testing, you get really interesting results. So how do we apply this to more complex things? Um, allow me to introduce you to model-based testing. Um, model -based, this is like a, a really powerful technique. Um, basically what you do is uh, you build a simplified model of the system. Like if you're building a database, maybe you can just use a hash map for that. And basically the point of the model is just to encode your like, expectations about how the system should behave. Um, the simpler it is, the better, because it's also like a cognitive aid. Um, once you have that simplified model of the system, uh, you'll basically use a library to generate uh, a random sequence of operations that apply both to the implementation and the model. And if their behavior ever diverges, uh, then you know that you either have a problem with the model, the implementation, or both. Um, yeah, we found a problem. Um, and uh, you know, if, if you build something like this on top of prop test, or another popular library you might have heard of called QuickCheck, um, you can basically just like keep rerunning uh, this long sequence of operations, which it might initially be quite large, like 100 operations. And who wants to like, actually like, figure out which particular subsequence of those operations led to the failure? Um, so these libraries are wonderful because they will randomly pick operations to drop out of that sequence, rerun the test, and if it continues to fail, basically keep dropping elements out of that operation uh, sequence. Um, so it basically is able to shrink all these like, random operations into the specific subsequence that triggers uh, your failure. Um, for an example, let's start off by building a tree, um, just like a simple tree with an optional root. And let's not actually implement the, uh, the methods. Let's just like, have them do nothing on our tree. Um, so this is a, uh, a little library that I wrote to make model-based tests fit on my slides for this talk. Um, but it turns out that uh, it's actually pretty good at significantly reducing the boilerplate required to do this kind of testing. Um, so uh, we have uh, this tree that we're building as the implementation. Um, and let's just use like a B tree map as our model. Um, and basically what this macro says is we, uh, we have two operations that we're defining, set and get, um, and along with their associated generators. Um, and we're generating a key and a value for sets that we insert into both the implementation and the model. And then when we try to get a randomly generated key out of uh, these structures, we expect the values to be the same. When we run it, uh, it basically generates like a long sequence of, of operations. Um, and this is like actually amazing because it just found two specific operations. If you set two to a value, and then you try to get to, then the operations diverge. Because remember, we didn't actually implement uh, the, our tree. We just kind of like had to do nothing um, and return none for everything for the gets. Um, but what actually happened under the hood was that this generated like, like 100 operations. And then when it found a failure, it kind of boiled it down into something that's super understandable. So this is great for like actually trying to like, like figure out what could have happened because we don't just get like this crazy like fuzzing input. Um, like with, if you've ever used fuzzers before, sometimes it can be really difficult to figure out what was the actual thing that went wrong. But this lets our tests tell us stories that we can understand as humans. So we can also do more complex things, like imagine we were building a database. Um, you could do like a restart just by like dropping the thing, having it close its file descriptors, and then open it again. And basically this could check for like, think like, is the data still in the database that I expected to be in the database? Um, okay, uh, slight diversion into a really cool property uh, that many systems we would like to have, um, and it's called linearizability. Um, you might have heard of it. Um, it's, it's something like a lot of like, distri like distributed systems people love like talking about and like throwing, uh, throwing out there, um, but most of them don't actually understand what it means. Um, and basically means that um, all of our operations happen at one particular time, and, uh, and it has to be at some point after it starts and before it finishes. Like if you basically send uh, a request to a distributed, or any database, uh, or even just like call a database, an embedded database library to set a key, um, that that key should be set after you call 
the, um, the set, and at some point before it actually returns to you. Um, this sounds obvious, but um, many things don't actually act this way. Um, but this is a really nice property to have, and it can also be tested in totally a black box way by just looking at particular operations that you might issue in a concurrent way for multiple threads or multiple servers, um, and then look at the return values. Um, and then just like after you have all the operations that happened and all of the return values, try to find some permutation of those operations and return values that could have been done by a single thread or a single client sequentially. Um, and if you can't find that, then it's not linearizable. Um, so I wrote this little macro, also in the model library, um, that can do this for arbitrary concurrent data structures. Um, in this case, it's just like using an atomic U size. Um, so basically imagine like multiple threads trying to do this buggy add. So atomic U size is, is interesting because you can basically have multiple threads change a counter, or, or rather a U size value, um, without taking out a mutex or anything. Um, and it relies on atomic operations of our CPUs to actually guarantee atomicity. However, if two threads basically get to the line where we load the value, um, like let current equal I load, um, then two threads could basically read like four, for instance, and if one of those threads, it, it, let's say that both of those threads are just trying to add one to it. If these were happening at uh, atomically, then we would end up with six, like plus one, plus one. However, if both threads read four and then add one to it, they'll both try to then store five. Um, so we just lost a write. Um, so this is able to basically run uh, these operations concurrently, look at the return values, and then just find bugs in your concurrent data structures. With, and, and look how little code that is. Like, like you think of like concurrency testing, and like usually it's it's like a, a monstrous uh, amount of effort. But um, we can really start to uh, reduce the amount of effort that goes into these things. And I'd love to keep talking about model testing, but uh, it's time to get like, even more torturous. Um, but these are some really great papers by uh, one of like, the pioneers in model testing, John Hughes. Um, and he's the creator of QuickCheck. And uh, yeah, I, I highly recommend checking out these papers if this is something you're interested in. They're, um, they're, they're quite accessible, and they don't use a lot of academic jargon. Cool, so what about things that actually do I.O.? Um, like things that use files, um, things that use sockets. Um, well, uh, like we can do fault injection for that. Uh, we have an issue where when we deploy things to production on possibly like thousands of servers or even just give things out to a bunch of users, um, they often encounter far more problems with the issue than we were able to detect when we were doing testing on our laptops. Um, so our, our laptops tend to be these like serene places where not very many things go wrong. And uh, basically, when we build things that work well on our laptops, that actually doesn't guarantee very much about how they're going to behave in the world. Um, so the solution is to basically intentionally mess stuff up as we're running these tests. Um, quick aside, we can, we can mess up so many things, but like, it probably would make sense to focus our attention real quick. Um, so there was a wonderful paper that came out of the University of Toronto in 2014 uh, called Simple Testing Can, Preve Can Prevent Most Critical Failures. Um, and what they found was that 92% like, of all critical failures have some like, like, trace of a, a consideration in the code like if, uh, for instance, in Rust, if, like, if you're doing like a match and like there's some match arm that's like, you know, this, this thing is like an error, then like maybe like do a log statement about it, but don't actually fix it. Um, things like this, um, where like there's like, and, and almost all critical bugs that bring systems down, like we, we begin to think about the issue, but we don't really finish it. Furthermore, in 58% of those cases, um, they could have easily been, like this could have easily been fixed if we just like actually triggered those failures and test. So we actually don't really need to go too overboard with these things. We just need to actually exercise our testing code um, when we think of things. A lot of code ends up just looking like this, where like you know, if there's an error somewhere, maybe we log it, maybe we just have a to do, uh, or maybe we bring down the whole system. And I'm not against panicking at all. Like, I, I, I'm very much a fan of like the Erlang let it crash philosophy. Um, and when you can't guarantee safe execution of a system, uh, crashing is usually better or very frequently better um, than not continuing at all. Um, however, there's another thing which is like unavailability amplification, where something bad happens and then like you do something even worse in response, um, and that might not be the best way to handle this problem. So there's a wonderful, uh, wonderful crate that uh, Pincap put out called Fail, and uh, Fail is inspired by FreeBSD uh, uh, fail points, which they use for testing their kernel, and it basically allows you to trigger um, externally a particular 
a, a particular like return statement, um, or it can also cause like a, a thread sleep or a scheduler yield. Um, and basically, what you do is in some test, um, you basically say, "Hey, I'd like to turn that fail point on," and then when we run the the code, it will basically trigger that um, that error to be returned, um, and then uh, we'll basically be able to exercise our uh, our error handling logic. One uh, little gotcha is if you're using something like quick check or prop test in combination with this, they'll often be using multiple threads in the same process, uh, and uh, the fail crate uh, has like a global registry of which fail points are enabled. So just like wrap a mutex around it or something so that uh, they don't conflict. Uh, advanced technique is yeah combining fail tests uh, or fail points uh, with generative testing property tests. Um, Basically, it can be kind of um, a pain to like for every possible uh, piece of of error handling logic to basically like manually trigger that in a test that we write. But if we just write one test like this, it'll get around to triggering all of them. Um, and like depending on how much we're able to uh, basically specify our expectations about general failures, this can dramatically reduce the amount of effort that goes into it. Um, here's an example of one test uh, for the SLED project. Um, and I, I would have never written this test. Uh, it basically sets a key, it deletes the same key, uh, it triggers one fail point, and it just goes down this list of things. I would have just never written this test. But by having this kind of infrastructure that just like, creates tests for me, it creates bugs that are just like, maniacal. Um, and it's also deterministically replayable, so it's not so hard to debug. Cool, and to learn more about this, um, or like working with files rather, if you'd like to go deeper, um, there was a, another paper that came out in 2014, um, which was like a great year in like reliability and testing. Um, and this one uh, is basically about this tool called Alice, where they're able to basically uh, record using a modified S trace all of the disk operations that uh, commonly used databases are using. Um, and then based on models of different file systems, it will replay those, um, those operations in ways that could have realistically happened on different common file systems. Um, and then just start them up again and see if there's any, uh, any strange behavior. And they broke like every database. They broke like SQLite, which like everyone thinks of as like this incredibly well-tested database, and it is. Um, but even SQLite fell um, to this uh, incredible testing tool. So check out that paper if you're interested in going deeper on like particularly like, like file testing. Um, cool, what about like network sockets and uh, just things that end up uh, talking with each other, uh, yeah, using them. Um, so one option is Jepson, which you might have heard of. And this is another really cool tool. Um, basically, it's like another one of these tools that um, like pretty much every system that it gets turned loose against uh, tends to fall. Um, it's, it's famous for like, you know, bringing down like Redis and MongoDB. Um, and basically what it does is it will spin up a cluster uh, and then run some workload against that cluster and then start partitioning the nodes from each other so that they can't talk to each other. And then after running the workload, it will look at a trace of the, like, the return values that the different clients observed, and it will like, basically do linearizability testing and see if, like, if this like, should be allowed or not. And it's just found so many bugs. It's, it's really wonderful. However, um, it's, uh, like, it also can be kind of expensive to get set up. Um, it can take like a month to actually like implement it in a nice way for a particular system, and it's like it ends up being like so expensive to use that like many companies that end up doing it end up writing like blog posts about like yeah we finally got Jepson works working and it's like uh, it's, it's a lot of work, um, and also it takes like five minutes per run to uh, to work, um, but it is like very nice and nothing else fully replaces it because it is completely black box, uh, which means like it will catch like like bugs that happen anywhere. In the system, and that's it is quite a nice property, and uh, it's if you if you can spend that kind of energy engineering uh, time on it, then it's a cool thing to have. Another option, TLA plus. So TLA plus uh, was created by Leslie Lamport. Um, he's the person who cre uh, created like LaTeX and Paxos and vector clocks. Um, so he's kind of like the patron saint of distributed systems, um, and. Uh, uh, basically, what this uh, what TLA plus lets you do is describe algorithms and also invariants that should hold for different uh, kind of interleavings of different different processes that are running through these algorithms, and it will find violations of those invariants. And it's very effective at doing this. Um, 
it's also uh, intended as like a learning tool, um, where like just by using it and learning how to like actually write TLA plus, you kind of like dramatically improve your ability to reason about correct systems. Um, so I highly recommend learning this. Um, also, it has like a wonderful video course uh, where he's like wearing like different fuzzy hats and things, and uh, like I, it's worth watching just for the hats. But the, the content is also incredible. And also, uh, Hillel has a, uh, a site, learntla.com, which is wonderful uh, for getting into it as well. So uh, it's a really cool tool, um, but it has this, like, it is another language. And then there's this question of, like, okay, we described our algorithm in this language, and then we have this implementation. And, like, like there's, is there a gap? Like, is my implementation actually doing what I expect? Um, sometimes that, that's, a, that's a challenge. Cool. And uh, the option that um, I'm going to go farther into is network simulation. And that's where we just kind of like start off building our system in a way that is very amenable to fast testing um, in a deterministic way. And it can be like just like extremely efficient. Um, like, it, it, you, yeah, basically can run like thousands of tests per second. It's, it's incredible. Um, also, um, like one issue with fault injection in general is like sometimes it can be uh, like, an, like a question about like which things do you actually uh, break? Like, you know, the, you can break so many things, so how do you focus it? Um, Lineage-driven fault injection, I'll get into in a second, um, is one way to do that. And it's very, uh, it works very well with something that you build from the beginning to be, uh, to basically run on a simulator. It's, at, I've been building a, like distributed systems on top of simulators for like about like the last year, and it's, I, I just have to say that like I have never caught so many bugs so early with like so much ease as when I started doing this. Um, it, it's something that kind of sounds like it has a high cost initially, but once you try it, you're just like instantly hooked, and and like you never like you never feel safe writing distributed systems code without a simulator again in the future. Um, you just find so many bugs that. You're, Totally, like you would have never, you would have never thought to check for. It's incredible. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of like uh, give you kind of like a, a skeleton view of like how you might implement a simulator. Um, one way to do it is by basically having a trait receive that um, basically uh, at a at a given time you uh, you have like some node and it receives a message from a peer uh, and you're basically given a message at that time from that peer. And in order to uh, uh, and basically, you just respond with a vector of outgoing messages in response to that. And by having this deterministic mapping between inputs and outputs, uh, we can basically start running our clusters in accelerated time. Um, we can generate a cluster, also using something like quick check or, uh, or prop test, where we generate a random set of partitions, which are basically pairs of nodes that can't communicate with each other at particular times. Uh, and then we have like a, a priority queue implemented as a binary heap of all of like the messages that are in flight in the in the network, um, as well as like uh, the the responses that clients get that we can basically perform invariant checks on after the fact. Um, so basically, uh, uh, for every message in uh, the in flight priority queue, we just pop it off. Uh, we deliver it to the destination at the time that we decided it should be. Um, then we, uh, we basically deterministically like, determine how long it should run, uh, or rather, how long it would, will take to get to its destination. Um, then we check, is that allowed based on the partitions that we, we just came up with? If so, skip it. Um, uh, if not, we basically put it back into the priority queue that we continue to iterate over. And then when there's nothing left in the priority queue, we know that basically our, uh, our cluster is quiet, and now we can run our invariant checks on the client responses. So this sounds nice, um, but you know, it's like a whole cluster in a box, and that sounds really complex. How do you choose like, efficiently which things to, uh, to mess with? Um, and that's where something called lineage-driven fault injection comes in. Um, Basically, it just looks at the things that go right and, uh, and then deterministically uh, like, uh, picks different permutations of them uh, to mess up. Um, you start with the very last thing. So imagine like a, a chain of messages, uh, like you're like passing a secret along from one person to another, um, and then you just basically pick like the last person who sent it and just like, nope, nope, you do not send it. Um, and just like work your way backwards um, and then see what happens. Um, uh, so Peter Alvaro, one of the creators of lineage-driven fault injection, uh, has a nice quote, which is, fault tolerance is redundancy in space and time. So basically, if that message uh, being dropped uh, does not affect the overall correctness of the system, like if it is retried, um, then we're still good. Um, 
And when we're building things that are simulator friendly to begin with, it basically makes this extremely easy to do. Um, and I'm working on a crate for this right now. Uh, cool. Um, we want our stuff to be deterministic, though, if it's going to work well in a simulator. Um, so for that, uh, we need to control our clocks, random number generators, and also our, our, like the way that our threads are scheduled. Um, basically, you can control threads um, using Linux real-time priorities, as well as like ptrace and other things. Um, files can be wrapped in a mutation log uh, that basically just measure, like, keeps track of what threads are doing what writes at what time, and then when synchronization happens. Um, and then, like, if you want to basically simulate some kind of crash, uh, you basically just like you know flip a flag from the test, um, and then just like allow no more writes or syncs. Um, and then when you like restart the system, just you know deterministically choose some subset of that data that was written since the last sync to drop. Um, and you can check out the crate deterministic um, for like deterministic versions of clocks, uh, RNGs, and uh, also using Linux real-time uh, priorities. And I'm working on the file thing also. Um, miscellaneous things. Uh, generally isolate business logic from I.O. concerns and uh, control flow logic. Um, this is uh, something I notice a lot of people um, who are writing things using futures and asynchronous code uh, kind of uh, violating the idea of. Um, basically, um, like, we, we, we would do well to the extent that we se like, like separate concerns. Um, we can take advantage of all of the performance benefits of asynchronous code um, without basically mixing all of our business logic into it. And, uh, and there's, I mean, this is not true in every case, um, but in most cases it is. And I think this is something that we should strive for for understandability. Um, also use asserts and debug asserts everywhere um, when basically testing um, our, uh, our code in random ways. Uh, having lots of these asserts will basically check uh, lots of assumptions. Um, use them, uh, use debug assert if you're concerned about performance implications because it gets compiled away, um, and try to use expect instead of unwrap to give the poor people who have to deal with the panics that are inevitable with calling unwrap um, a little bit of uh, uh, information to help them when it happens. And also, when you propagate errors, try to include uh, context. Uh, so for instance, using the failure crate um, can be nice for this. Cool, go break systems. Thank you. Thank you.